All right, here we are, Ecclesiastes for Beginners. This is lesson number nine in the series, uh, Ecclesiastes chapter seven, and uh, the title of this one is The Wisdom Proverbs. So in the first six chapters of the book of Ecclesiastes, we see the fruit of Solomon's rebellion. He disobeyed God in marrying foreign wives and they led him away from the Lord. Uh, to compensate for this loss, Solomon tried to find satisfaction in a variety of earthly, <clears throat> excuse me, or worldly ways. So by chapter six, he's exhausted his search and he sees that the results of that search is empty. The search to find meaning and satisfaction in life without reference to God. So in chapter seven, we see Solomon turning again to God and this time, um, and this turning rather, is seen as he begins to write about true wisdom. Because he's been writing about wisdom, right? the wisdom, the, th the things that he's learned about life under the sun, life you know, separate from God. So there is wisdom there uh, that he's been writing about, but now he's going to write about true wisdom. And he does this by writing his thoughts in the form of Proverbs, and he uses a literary device known as parallelism. And parallelism is a, a device used uh, not only in the Bible, other authors, other uh, individuals of that era used uh, this device, but uh, we see it used in the Old Testament. Parallelism is where the author contrasts or emphasizes ideas by repeating them in different ways. Repeating them, contrasting them, you know, adding to them. For example, uh, there is a device called contrasting parallelism, and that device shows the difference. And before we move on to chapter seven, I just want to give you some examples of this type of parallelism so that when we do read the section that we're going to study today, you'll have an idea of what's going on here. For example, Proverbs 13.1, a wise son accepts his father's discipline, but a scoffer does not listen to rebuke. So there you have contrasting parallelism, showing the difference. You know, a wise son does this, you know, a scoffer does that. Another type of parallelism, completive, Comparalelism stacks information to complete the thought. So uh, Proverbs 14, 13, even in laughter the heart may be in pain and the end of joy may be grief. So two ideas similar, one idea is expressed and then another idea, a similar one is simply added to it to kind of complete the, um, complete the thought. Uh, one more example, uh, comparative. Parallelism obviously draws a comparison, Proverbs 25. It is better to live in a corner of the roof than in a house shared with a contentious woman. So here he is making a comparison. So each of these, and there are more types of parallelism by the way, but I've just shown you a couple. Each of these devices are used to emphasize the points that he's trying to make. So in Chapter seven, verses one to 15, in the discussion of true wisdom, Solomon uses seven comparative, one contrastive in verse four, and one completive in verse seven device. Okay, so now that we've kind of had this little uh, aside about uh, literary devices, let's go into uh, chapter seven, beginning in verse one. The first uh, proverb that he gives, a uh, wisdom proverb, the value of a good name. A good name, he says, is better than a good ointment. A comparative proverb comparing uh, a good name to good ointment, good perfume, good oil. A uh, good ointment, the idea is that good ointment gives off a, a lovely fragrance, it blesses all who enjoy the aroma, it has value just by being there. Uh, and it's a wonderful gift to someone else. So is a good name. You know, the name that you have you know, as a man, as a woman, that you pass on to your children. You know, it's, it's a good thing if your children are able to go somewhere and they say they run into someone or they meet someone and the, 
you know, that person says, oh, you're you know, John's son or you're Bud's son. You know? Oh, I knew your father. He was, a, he was a wonderful man. That's a good thing. That's to your advantage. You, know, you, you certainly don't want to run into someone and that person say, so has, is your father still in jail? You know, I mean, that's not <laughs> at your job interview. <laughs> you don't want that. So there's value in having a good name. And once you spoil it, once you dilute it, it's almost impossible to regain its former value or potency. Very important to have and maintain a good reputation. Another proverb, he says, death is better than birth and the day of one's death is better than the day of one's birth. Comparative parallelism. Once the end has come, we can understand the whole story in context. Now for believers, of course, the end signals the beginning of a new and more enjoyable spiritual life. At death, we've come to the end of suffering and trouble. There is no more to come. Now for the Christian, there's more to come. Um, in the life that we aspire to after death, given to us by God through Christ. So our death is not necessarily a time of regret. Oh, it's all over, if I only had a little more time, a little more this, a little more that. No, uh, for us the time of death is actually the turning of a page, the beginning of a spiritual life. So you can, you can kind of take this uh, both ways if you want. Another wisdom proverb. Funerals are better than weddings. It is better to go to a house of mourning than to go to a house of feasting because that is the end of every man and the living takes it to heart. Comparative, actually comparative uh, at the beginning, you know, better to go here than there and then a completive couplet is added at the end. So you have a comparison and then you have an extra line to kind of you know, solidify the, the thought. The idea is you learn many more important things at a funeral than you do at a wedding. And as a minister, I can vouch for that. You know, at a wedding, even if you give a little speech or you know, a short devotional message or sermon, nobody's listening. <laughs> Who's listening to the preacher? Everybody's looking at the gown, the dress, the decoration. It's, it's as it should be. But at a funeral, oh yeah, everybody's listening at a funeral. Everybody's paying attention at the funeral. I mean, the, the deceased is right there in front of you. So you know, this ancient wisdom is still very much part of our understanding today. And that's because funerals remind us of our short lives. They, they draw us close to our families. They teach us about the frailties of life, whereas weddings are for rejoicing. More pleasant, of course, but not more instructive. Funerals force us to face God regarding our sins, our need for mercy, and of course, weddings rarely do this. And a wedding is not the place for that. There's a time for everything, and at a wedding, it's time to rejoice, it's time to be happy, it's time to look forward to good things. Another proverb, sorrow is better than laughter, somewhat the same as the one we've just read, a contrasting parallelism here. He says, sorrow is better than laughter, for when a face is sad, a heart may be happy. The mind of the wise is in the house of mourning, while the mind of fools is in the house of, in the house of pleasure. So sober-mindedness brought on by the trials of life is more profitable than the laughter and the merrymaking we experience during the good times. Again, you know, when, do we, when do we learn our lessons? Well, we learn our lessons when we're down in the valley, right? <laughs> when things are difficult, when things are tough. That's when we draw close to God. That's when we're, we're asking, well, you know, why this God? Show me, give me wisdom, Lord. Help me through, Lord, whatever. We learn stuff when we're down in, the, down in the valley. When we're up on the mountaintop, well, we're just so busy enjoying it all, you know, we, there's not much to learn up on the mountaintop. So in life, 
Both sorrow and laughter, you know, we experience both, but it's in sorrow that we draw closer to the Lord and usually learn the most valuable lessons in, in life. Now he's not telling us to be you know, sour pusses. He's encouraging us to benefit from those times when we experience sorrow, because when we experience sorrow in our lives, what's the thing we're always looking to do? We, we're, just, we're asking God, please, I want it over. I want it to stop. I want it to end, right? And that's not really the prayer that we need to be making when we're you know, down in the valley. When we're down in the valley, we need to be asking God to show us. What can I learn from this? What is it you're trying to teach me? Sometimes just the testing of our faith is the only lesson. Can you get through the valley and still believe? Can you, can you be in the valley and still be loving? Can you be in the valley and still have hope? Can you be in the valley and still believe? You know, I often say, you know, we're, we're in the hands of God to live or to die. To live or to die. Ascending or descending. We're always in the hands of God. Another wisdom proverb, better a rebuke than listening to foolishness. Here you have completive parallelism. In verse five, he states the premise, better to be rebuked, which is unpleasant, by a wise person than listen to entertainment that has no value for growth or development. It just feels good, makes me laugh, helps me you know, get things off my mind or whatever. Then in verse six, he says, for as the crackling of thorn bushes under a pot, so is the laughter of the fool. And this too is futility. So he completes the picture here by adding a comparative verse, showing what fools and their jokes really are like, like burning thorns that make noise, a crackling noise, as they are being destroyed. This is how useless they are. I won't comment on how much of that is going on in our present society. Verse seven, for oppression makes a wise man mad and a bribe corrupts the heart. A final completive, so he starts with a comparative and he gives two completive verses, right, to kind of add more information to what he's saying. Um, yes, it's better to listen to the rebuke or advice of a wise man, but even in this, you need to be careful. In difficult times, you can easily be manipulated by seemingly wise advice. And as example, he shows how under extreme circumstances, a person could corrupt all wisdom by accepting a bribe. Hard times makes people do silly things, foolish things, uh, a better word, desperate things. Things we would never do when things are just kind of even keeled. You know, we would never even consider those things, but put enough pressure on us through illness or loneliness or you know, whatever, the, the, the trials of life, we're more susceptible to temptation. The things we know that are true, the things we know that are wise, that are right, that are good, we know them up here. But when we're under pressure, we're not under pressure up here, we're under pressure down here in the heart. And that's where we become susceptible to temptation. So Solomon is saying, be very careful, even those who think they are wise could fall into temptation. And who better to tell us this than Solomon himself, <laughs> the wisest man that lived. Another one, another wisdom parable from the section. The end is better than the beginning. You, do you notice a kind of a, a, a pattern here in these things? The end of a matter is better than its beginning. You know, uh, this is a comparative one, comparative parallelism. It's easy to start, it's hard to finish. When I was working at Oklahoma Christian and they had the, the first day you know, of you know, orientation for the new students that were coming in, and uh, different faculty members and administrative people had a chance to speak to them, you know, a little encouragement, a little pep talk, whatever. When it was my turn, 
This was my theme. This is the easy part. Filling out your paperwork, that's the easy part. Getting into your dorm room, that's the easy part. That's the exciting part. Got in your classes, you know, you're away from home. Whoa, that's the easy part. The hard part's to finish. <laughs> that's the hard part, because they only give you the diploma after you've finished. <laughs> they don't give it to you just for enrolling. <laughs> now, just enrolling, you, you get an invoice for that. Your parents do anyways. And that's what Solomon is saying here. It's easy to start, a lot of starters, it's just hard to, to finish. The excitement of starting gives way to the joy of completing. Both are good, but to finish something is always sweeter. Always sweeter. And then number seven, a patient spirit is better than a proud spirit. Patience of spirit is better than haughtiness of spirit. Do not be eager in your heart to be angry, for anger resides in the bosom of fools. Do not say, why is it that the former days were better than these? For it is not from wisdom that you ask about these. Again, a beginning with a comparative, uh, with comparative uh, parallelism and then moving to completive, several verses to complete the thought. What he's saying is God desires to develop our character as we go from birth to death. And in this regard, Solomon says that this involves replacing our pride with the quality of patience. Because pride has a tendency to push patience aside. Get out of the way. I'm in a hurry here. I'm a man with a mission. I'm a man who's going to make things happen. Just get out of the way, patience. That's what pride does. Patience leads to the development of godly character. Solomon adds that a, a proud spirit uh, can lead to the harboring of anger and resentment, which are the characteristics of a fool. That's why I hate reading, you know, well, a love-hate relationship with the Proverbs, because every time he says, the fool does this, you know, it's like he's talking to me. <laughs> It's very hard on the ego. In addition to this, pride and bitterness can lead to wasteful and foolish longings for yesterday. Wisdom, on the other hand, lives in the present. That's the point. Wisdom lives in the present, learns from the past, and looks forward to the future. I don't long for the past. I learned from the past. There's a difference. I don't live in the future. I look forward to the future. That's the proper attitude. I look forward to the future and do whatever I need to do today in order to plan for the future. But I live in today. Why? Well, because that's all I've got is today. Today, God has given me just enough emotional and spiritual resources to deal with what happens today. And what people do often is they take those emotional and spiritual resources and they uh, invest them into tomorrow. Worrying about, stressing over, whatever, tomorrow. Or looking back at the past, shoulda, coulda, woulda. And so if you invest your spiritual and emotional energy into tomorrow or yesterday, what happens? You got nothing left for today. You know, Jesus is telling us one day at a time, we live one day at a time. That's not just a suggestion. <laughs> That's how to actually live, one day at a time. As a result, the wise can flourish despite difficulties and obstacles while the foolish are, are, are doomed to live in the past or repeat the same mistakes in the future. In the last four verses of this section, Solomon explains the advantages of wisdom. He's already said that the foolish and wise end up in the same way, you know, they both die, but he now concedes that the wise person has two advantages over the fool. Even though they both die in the end, the wise person has two advantages. First, wisdom guards against pitfalls. 
He says, wisdom along with an inheritance is good and an advantage to those who see the sun. For wisdom is protection just as money is protection, but the advantage of knowledge is that wisdom preserves the lives of its possessors. Yes, both the fool and wise die, but the wise person makes less mistakes along the way and learns how to preserve his life. Wisdom does not extend life, but it can enable one to have a better quality of life. That's the secret. And then he also says, the advantages of wisdom. Wisdom gives a divine perspective. Verse 13 and 14, consider the work of God, for who is able to straighten what he has bent? In the day of prosperity be happy, but in the day of adver adversity consider, God has made the one as well as the other, so that man will not discover anything that will be after him. So wisdom helps one to consider the work of God. What does this mean? How, how do we do this? Well, we can't change what he does and we cannot know what he does not reveal. Whatever we know, it's because he has revealed it. The spiritual, you know, the theological, he has revealed it. We would not know God to the depth that we do know him today had not he revealed himself, most especially through his son, Jesus Christ. Had Jesus not come, never appeared, we would not know. We would know that perhaps God is great because it takes a great being to create all of this, but we would not know, we would not know that He loves us, that He considers us with a merciful attitude. We wouldn't know that had He not revealed that to us. However, in knowing our limit, we can seek Him in humility, and this is the first step in finding eternal life. So this section on wisdom should teach us a couple of important lessons. First, we need to seek God in making decisions in our lives, and we should be seeking His wisdom, not our wisdom. Remember, the first six chapters, Solomon is expounding on the wisdom that he has learned here under the sun. In these Proverbs, he's encouraging us to seek beyond the sun, go to God, find what his wisdom is. And secondly, ask God to reveal to us what we do not understand. I go back to you know, when you're in the valley, when, you, when things are tough, a good prayer to to utter during those times is to ask God, what is it that I'm not getting here? What is it that I don't understand? Not about the illness or how long is it going to take before I'm well again, because that's the normal prayer we all pray. No, not about that, but about my life at this point. Is there something I'm not understanding, Lord? Please make it plain to me. You know, if we have true wisdom, We'll be doing this on a regular basis. And doing this is what life is all about. This is the answer to the question, what is life all about? Well, it's about seeking God, that's what it's about. It's about asking Him to reveal Himself to us and His purpose for us, whatever that might be. So now that Solomon has given us a few proverbs about the value of wisdom, he, um, he will go on to explain some of the ways that wisdom can benefit a person in his or her life. So verses 15 to 29, he gives us three things that wisdom provides the person who, ava who avails himself of it. Number one, wisdom provides balance. He says, I have seen everything during my lifetime of futility. There is a righteous man who perishes in his righteousness and there is a wicked man who prolongs his life in his wickedness. Do not be excessively righteous and do not be overly wise. Why should you ruin yourself? Do not be excessively wicked and do not be a fool. Why should you die before your time? It is good that you grasp one thing and also not let go of the other. For the one who fears God comes forth with both of them. Wisdom provides balance. In these seemingly contradicting verses, Solomon is telling his readers that in a world where there are extremes, the middle road is the one that is dictated by wisdom. 
that the good perish young and the wicked live long is a testimony of this contradictory world. However, wisdom allows us not to be so pious that we cannot face reality, you know, too heavenly bound to be any earthly good. And on the other hand, not so wicked that you're, you put your life in danger. In danger. I mean, all men are sinners, but some revel in it and give themselves to it fully. You know, the quote, the hell raisers. You know, he's saying, why should you be a hell raiser? You want to die young? <laughs> you want to have a hard time? Do you want to learn the hard way? It's not a proverb in the Bible, but blessed is the man who learns from the experience of another. Don't you wish you could have taught your teenagers that? How many of us who have had you know, raised families, now they're all grown and gone, how many of us, I think all of us at some time have said, if you would just listen to me, if you would just you know, I bear you no ill will. I love you. I want the best for you. I'm telling you, I did this thing here. I did it. And I'm here to tell you, it leads to nowhere. It's nothing but trouble. And they go ahead and do it anyways, right? Of course. So wisdom provides balance by avoiding the extremes a wise man can live a good life here and have the one to come as well. Another lesson, you know, wisdom at work. Wisdom provides strength. I have seen everything during my lifetime of futility. There's a, righteousness, a righteous man who perishes in his righteousness and there's a wicked man who prolongs his life in his wickedness. Do not be excessively righteous and do not be overly wise. Why should you ruin yourself? Also, do not take seriously all words which are spoken so that you will not hear your servant cursing you, for you also have realized that you likewise have many times cursed others. So he begins by saying that wisdom uh, is worth the strength of 10 rulers of cities. In other words, there is great strength in wisdom, especially in three areas, the strength to handle sin. You know, oh, I got a slide here, there we go. The strength to handle sin, no man is perfect. Everyone sins and comes, you know, causes trouble. Everyone does that. But wisdom helps to deal with the fallout of sin in our lives. Strength to avoid entrapment. It's easy to be taken in by flattery or you know, winning deceit. Wisdom helps us have a, a fair estimate of ourselves so that we're not easily taken in by this sort of thing. And then thirdly, the strength to deal with criticism. Sometimes we're justly and unjustly criticized. It doesn't matter, you know, they say, go ahead, <laughs> have you ever done that? Go ahead, just tell me honestly. Just be honest with me. Don't, don't, hold, you know, don't hold back, tell me. What do you really think of my work, my this, my whatever it is? You know? <laughs> and that person goes ahead and tells you, ouch. <laughs> So unjust criticism is painful, but even just criticism is just as painful. Wisdom helps us deal with this in a, by reminding us that this is a natural part of life. Even we are guilty of such things. You know, even we talk about others sometimes. Have you never done that? You're talking, you're, you're two guys talking about a third guy, Johnny over here and Johnny, I don't know where Johnny's at and Johnny, you know, boy, I wish he could get his act together. And Johnny just shows up in the middle of your conversation. <laughs> kind of embarrassing, isn't it? It's what he's talking about right here. So wisdom builds a strong character that doesn't cave in to problems or flattery or even criticism. And then, so, so how does wisdom serve us? Just to kind of keep us, in, keep us focused on what we're talking about here. Uh, it helps us to have balance in life. It gives us strength in life. And then thirdly, wisdom provides insight. True satisfaction comes from a relationship with God, yes. And the reason this produces satisfaction is because it is only in this relationship that we gain salvation, which brings peace to our souls and that we gain insight, understanding. Peace and understanding equal satisfaction. Peace and understanding 
equal satisfaction. You feel relief and closure when you know what has happened. Solomon cites a few insights, a few ideas, a few pieces of understanding that his God-given wisdom has provided him. First, understanding only comes from God, verses 23 and 24. It says, I tested all of this with wisdom and I said, I will be wise, but it was far from me. What has been is remote and exceedingly mysterious. Who can discover it? Now he doesn't express it here, but he realizes that man can't produce wisdom. He can't reveal what God has hidden. We've already talked about that. Understanding is a joyful discovery that God gives us as a gift to all those who seek it by faith. Have you never had that experience? You're reading your Bible and then you go, and you see something, you've read it 10 times, and all of a sudden, boom, it's like you see it in 3D and you go, oh, that's what that means. Oh, isn't that a wonderful feeling? I understand now. Another insight from wisdom. Sexual adventure is not satisfying. And what is the promise? of illicit sex? What is always the promise of illicit sex? Well, it's going to be better. This is going to be more exciting. This will really give you satisfaction. You weren't satisfied before? Boy, have I got something for you. That's always the promise. But Solomon says <laughs> sexual adventure is not satisfying. I directed my mind to know, to investigate, and to seek wisdom and an explanation, and to know the evil of folly and the foolishness of madness. And I discovered more bitter than death the woman whose heart has snares and nets, whose hands are chains. One who is pleasing to God will escape from her, but the sinner will be captured by her. Behold, I have discovered this, says the preacher, adding one thing to another to still find an explanation which I am seeking but have not found. I have found one man among a thousand, but I have not found a woman among all of these. Oh boy, when you read this, there are you know, so many ways to interpret that. Sometimes women are offended. And I mean, when you just read it like that, whoa, is he saying we're stupid? No. So I go back to my notes. It says, in his life, there were few men, one in a thousand, he said, who could give a wise answer or bring him a satisfying answer. However, his thousand wives could not give him satisfaction. That's his point. That's his point. And of course, this is so because he violated the way which God designed sexual and intimate satisfaction to be found. One man, one woman for life. That's the only way we can find the intimacy that we crave for as human beings. On the surface, it would seem terrific. A thousand wives, wow, come on. And he's saying, <laughs> don't go there. Been there, done that, doesn't work. Number three, insights from wisdom. The problem is from within, not from without. Verse 29, behold, I have found only this, that God made men upright, but they have sought out many devices. His wisdom finally led him to understand that man's problems and the evil in the world do not come from God. They come from within man's sinful heart. And he says this with the idea, with the view that wisdom helps us to know where to lay the blame for the problems in our lives. We don't lay them at the feet of God. He, he doesn't send sin. And we shouldn't lay them at the feet of other people. The blame lays with ourselves. We're the ones responsible. So Solomon explains how his wisdom is finally working to lead him back to God by teaching him what true wisdom is and how it is to be properly applied to life. And that is to give balance to life, to provide strength for living that life, and to gain insight so that we understand what life is really all about. And as we mentioned earlier, life is about seeking God and knowing God. That's what life is. Isn't that what Jesus said? And this is eternal life, that you shall know God. 
So the quality, the substance of eternal life isn't a time thing, it's a quality thing. And the quality of it is determined by the depth of knowledge that we have of God. So eternal life doesn't just start after we die, it starts now. Now, we're in, the, we're in the process now of experiencing eternal life. What happens after we die is that we will be equipped with a glorified body that will enable us to know God in an unlimited way. Okay, well that's our lesson for this time. Thank you for your attention. We keep going next week with Ecclesiastes.